Okay, so the purpose of this is to show you how to implement the confirmatory factor analysis exercise that I have in SPSS in R. So I've downloaded the um, SPSS files in the zip file, so I'll just extract them. I'll delete that, and then let's have a look inside. What we have here is a data description. Talks about the 25 personality test items that are in here, as well as some of the other aspects. We have metadata. So here are the 25 um, items. We have an SPSS data file, well, actually we have two. We have an exploratory and a confirmatory, which, you know, in some cases might be, um, you know, you might want to run analyses on the exploratory and then modification indices to refine the items. So you get a final kind of structure, which you then evaluate on a confirmatory data file. We have the instructions in here, um, which talks about what we're going to do. So essentially, the aim is to fit a number of different models on this data set. Um, so one factor model, five factor uncorrelated. We also want to have a look at the modification indices, uh, create a table of model fits that includes um, key features. So to do this in R, uh, I'll be using my approach of project template. Um, so, I talk about this approach uh, on my blog and in, um, in my workshops on R. Um, so, this, this post talks all about it. Um, specifically, um, has the um, customized version of project template. So I'll just download a copy of that. And I'll put that in here. So that's just a zip file, which I then extract and um, give it an appropriate name, like uh, confirmatory factor anal analysis exercise. And I'll copy that name into the R project file, which will allow us to open it quickly in R Studio. Um, we then want to move uh, the data file or data files into the data folder. So these are these two SPSS files. Um, we copy them into there. And we give them the name that we want to give them. Um, I'll call this. Um, it's just a convention I use. I'll call this C cases. I don't know. I'll, I'll just I'll just run it on the um, on this confirmatory data file. So we'll, this is the cases. This is the clean participant cases we've got. Um, don't need any of these. Uh, we have some metadata, so I might as well copy them that in just in case we use it for any reason. Uh, it's a convention. I often call my metadata meta. And yeah, that will um, automatically import it into, um, yeah, import this information. And this information's got information about factor scoring, uh, item text, reversal, and so on. Okay, so we've set a few things up. I um, think if we, uh, Double click on this now. Um, assuming you've got R and R Studio installed, um, R Studio should open up. And the nice thing about opening R Studio through this project file is that you will now be in um, 
the correct working directory, which is where this is. And you know, you can see here in the file pane that you are in that uh, folder. So that's good. All right. So the first thing we want to do is uh, I'll go into reports and this RMD file. So this is where I'll work from. And if I run this line, library project template load project, it does a whole pile of things. Um, you can learn more about it in my specific post about project template, but essentially it's loading the data, running any initial data manipulations, importing relevant libraries and configuring relevant options. So we can see that C cases and metadata personality has been added to the global environment. Uh, so if I look at the first few rows of C cases, head C cases, uh, we can see that that looks like the data file that we would have seen, say, in SPSS. These are six rows of that data file, and we can see the variables up the top, A1 to 05, and a few demographics. And we can also see here, um, what else can we see? We can look at the dimensions of this. Uh, it's got 1,236 cases, 32 variables. Okay, that's good. Um, the next things we might want to do is just um, do a few manipulations. Um, it's just probably just a habit, but I like to make variables lowercase. I find it's easier to type and R is case sensitive, so we'll go names, C cases, like that, um, and I'll just make them all lower cases. So two lower, you see, makes all those variable names lower case. So yeah, now we have C cases and so on. So notice I'm putting this in. Um, a file called 01 slash munge.r and that's in the munge folder. Uh, munge refer is a term that refers to manipulating data, manipulating and cleaning data. The reason it's in a dedicated file is that this process occurs um, within this overall loading of the project. So whenever you're doing anything with a project, you want to analyze your data, the first step is load the data, manipulate the data, and then you can start analyzing it. So you run that one command and it gets you set up and ready to go. Another thing I like to do is um, create a variable list. Um, so this is an empty list at the moment, but I would like to have, um, I guess, the, um, the items in there. And so what we have here is A1 to 05. So Looks like we've got a bit of a, some sort of issue. I'll restart it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so hopefully we've got meta.personality here and we have the names of the items as well. Now they're also uppercase, so we want to get that consistent. Um, so I may actually go into the Excel spreadsheet and ensure these names are consistent. So I'll go uh, equals uh, lower. Do that for all the items. And then um, edit, paste special, and paste the values at the top. Okay, so now we've 
um, we've cleared those values and now they're all lowercase. So the benefit of that is that if I um, now rerun that, so reload meta.personality, we've now got lowercase names and I can then copy them in. And now we have lowercase items. So we seem to have a few extras, so we might just check what's going on there. So we have a look at the dimension. It seems like it's got 31 rows, so it looks like it's importing some extra data from that meta spread. So let's open that up and just clear that stuff out of the way. Um, Re-import all the data and then see whether that's disappeared. Still got 31 rows. Um, let's try and Delete that, save it, exit, re-import. There we go. Somehow we've deleted those. Those rows were coming out for some reason. Okay, so now we have those personality test items stored in a vector, which is which is handy. Um, and we could run a quick factor analysis on that data. So that's C cases with the variables um, stored in that vector, V star, V dollar items. And we'll have five factors because that's what we believe is there. And we can run a quick factor analysis. Um, probably we also want a um, Rotation the Promax, and um, yeah, we could store that as fact one, and yeah, we could print fact one. Um, I think this is how we do it, yeah. So, um, under loadings. You can see that you can have a cutoff and you can sort. So um, our items are already kind of sorted. Um, and, um, yeah, a cutoff of 0.3 is going to hide stuff. So yeah, we can see that there's not too many cross loadings. Factors seem to be loading up their primary factors. So that's a that's a basic uh, exploratory factor analysis. You know, we could look at something like discrete. Um, for this, uh, this scale. This is from the psych package. Um, and we can see one big factor, then a second, then a third, fourth, fifth. Uh, there's actually kind of arguably a meaningful sixth one there as well before the screen really begins. So that's an interesting um, tidbit, but that's not really the purpose of today. Um, but you certainly could go down the track of exploring the six factor. Um, now, I should mention while I'm at it here that uh, under config, we have this file called global.dcf. Um, and I have specified here in the library statement what libraries I'm, I'm using by default. So already we've got the site package loaded. So that was why I was able to use the screenplay straight, up, screenplay straight away, as well as the lattice and hmisc, which I, I sometimes use. So next step, um, uh, we also probably want to add the Levan package. If you don't have it installed, you'll have to do install.packages. Levan. And that'll download it off the internet and um, add it to your library. Or you can um, you can go to packages and go to install and type Levan. Okay, so yeah, Levine is what we'll be using for SEM.
Um, so next step, let's have a look at the Levan website. Here is the Levan project. So this is a really great place to get started with Levan. Um, you've got tutorials. So first example, CFA. So it's got some examples. Shows you how to define a model, fit the model and summarize the model. So let's, let's use that as an example. And we'll get the rest of it. So, yep, keep going. And summary. Okay, so. That's a good start. So we've got the idea that we're going to fit five, five models. Um, the first model I wanted to fit, um, perhaps we'll start with a five factor um, correlated model. So if we look at the names of, um, of the names of the items, we've got um, 25 items. Um, actually, to start with, I'll fit a global model. I'll fit a global factor model. So I'll call uh, uh, this um, M1. Well, actually, I'll, I'll call it, um, let's do it. Let's create models as a list. And I'll call this models M1. That way we can store the models in the list. So this is just going to be the first element of that list. We then have the, um, the syntax for our script. So on the left, we have the factors. And then we say, you know, is assigned these three indicators. All right, so I'm going to say global. And you can see here, we have to say each item a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 and so on. So we could certainly do that, a1 plus a2 plus a3. Um, little trick maybe, we could do paste the items and then I think collapse equals uh, plus. And there we go. Um, we've created um, that string. I believe uh, the constraint where the, the, the approach whereby the, an item is constrained to one and therefore defines the nature of the global factor is driven by the first item. So we may want to, if we wanted to ensure that the global factor is say a good personality, like an agreeable, conscientious, extroverted personality and so on, we may want to check that A1 is a positively worded item. And if we do that, uh, I think we said here, yeah, A1 is I mean different to the others. Um, yeah, so I think we can, I think we can formally specify it like this. So where we go one times that, that item. So that changes. Okay, so I'll hide that little thing, it's not really core. Cool. We're then going to um, fit the model. Uh, so we've got models M1 using this CFA function. So this is a Levan. Obviously Levan is not currently loaded because I haven't rerun that. Um, rerun this since I've updated my config file. So 
I'll also create a list of fits. And we'll call this fits M1 as well. Obviously I've reused the wrong data file, so let's see cases. Now we go, we've got fits M1. It's fit. Nothing really to say, but let's put it into the summary. And okay, that's much better. So you can see here, um, we have a chi-square value, um, test statistics, basic CFIs, um, RMSEAs and so on. So none of them are very good. Uh, it looks like my approach of constraining A3 to one did not prevent A1 from being um, a positive number. So what I'll, there are probably other ways of doing this. So I'll um, move this around and that'll just solve the Okay, so we rerun that and we check, and yes, A3 was constrained to be one um, and you can see that A1 has now got a negative load in it. Um, so yeah, if we wanted to interpret that, uh, we can certainly see that the fit's not great, but we could also see the loading of each item on the, the global factor. Now, by default, it looks like we've got uh, unstandardized estimates, which are fine, but uh, we may want to get the standardized estimates. Now, uh, I have a Levan cheat sheet, which is quite nice, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can get... Um, the. Uh, standardized solution by going to here. So we'll put the, um, the fit object into that argument. And there you go, you've got um, standardized uh, estimates of each item's loading on the global factor. And you can see that every item, well, some more, some less. So like the agreeableness items might be a little larger. Conscientiousness is quite high. Um, well, most things are pretty high in terms of standardized loadings. Perhaps a few of the agreeableness items are a bit quick. Okay, so we've successfully fit uh, a global factor. Um, okay, so what about a five factor model? How do we get that? So let's call this, um, you know, the five factor, um, five factor model. I think we'll have to specify or not specify correlations between factors um, in the CFA call, which is a little bit different to um, what's done in Amos. So what we need to do is Say something like agreeableness equals um, equals tilde, and then we'll well let's copy all this down, and we'll break it up, make it pretty so it's a bit aligned. Add the relevant bit. So consk equals tilde extra equals tilde neuro for neuroticism equals tilde openness equals tilde. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, as I said, we need to check that. The first item is positively worded for the scale. So conscientiousness, I'm excited for my work. That looks good, that's conscientious. Don't talk a lot, that's not. So find it difficult to approach, that's introversion. Know how to captivate people. So we'll just move E3 
into the first position, so that gets the um, the one, the constrainer, unstandardized loading of one, so that the directionality is captured. Get angry easily is fine, and I'm full of ideas. That's good. Okay, so now we've got model model two, um, and I guess model. That's kind of the same as well, just for I don't know, just for sort of consistency. Um, it is the same. So what we're wanting to do here is say M two. If this was uncorrelated, we're going to use this, um, and then I think there's orthogonal equals true. You can read the help on this, but. By default, orthogonal is false, so we're allowed correlated factors, but you can make orthogonal true, so that allows uncorrelated factors. So we'll have so we have the um, five-factor orthogonal solution, model two, and then the five-factor correlated factor solution, M3. Oops, what have I done there? Okay, um, so we could then repeat this process but for um, other models. So So there's the summary of model two. Um, and you know, we've got various fit information. Um, you probably want to start to actually compare some of these things. And likewise, we can do the same for M3. So at this point, yeah, you may want to be uh, wanting to compare the fits of these different three models, and we could do this for all the models. Um, one way, of course, is to run summary and you know find where the chi square is um, and say, oh, it's uh, five four six zero point two four two, and run it again here, blah blah blah, you know, and get the uh, now it's three thousand eighty seven. Point six six eight. Um, you could do that approach, but that's not a very our way of doing of doing things. Um, the final one there was two two three six five. So yeah, you can see that the chi square is being reduced substantially after each uh, step. Um, That's, that's good, yeah, sure, but um, what's the R way of doing it? So if we go back to this cheat sheet I pulled up before, see how do you extract specific fit measures? Okay, there's a fit measures function. So fit measures fits M1. And you see it returns a vector of relevant um, information. So let's um, let's define the set of um, fit measures we're interested in. Which ones do we want to pull out? Um, so let's get the names. And I'll put it in D put, which puts it in a nice little string that I can reuse. And that's the set of all kind of things I could potentially want to extract. Um, and I'll store it in a sort of general place. So so we might want to reuse this. Um, so I'll call it the um, fit indices. So these are the fit indices I want to keep. Um, so if I rerun the um, that can just remind us what each of these things is doing. So 
we think about it, we might want to have a number of parameters in the model, um, the chi-square, degrees of freedom. I think p-value is going to be so, it's always going to be significant, so it's probably not that interesting, but whatever. I quite like, just as, I don't know how much this is habit, but I often get CFI, um, RMSEA, um, as well as RMSEA confidence intervals. And I quite like SRMR as well. So yeah, it's a very, you know, it's just, there's lots of opinion about what's the best fit measures, but that's, um, um, yeah. Okay. So, So we now should have, I think, if I, yeah, I've run it, we have these fit indices. So the point of that is that when we run fit measures, we could store that, say, in x and go x. So x is a named vector. So if I wanted to pull out just the one of interest, I could do that. So now we've just got the um, measures of interest. Um, and I could perhaps round it to three decimal places. So that's, that's starting to look like a set of indices that we might want to pull out for each model. So we've got fit measures here. Um, so maybe this is a nice chance to make a function. Um, Call it core fit measures. Um, and it can take a fit object. It can take, which you know, to start with would be like um, fits M1. What else do we want? We want a, what those um, fit indices should be, and so by default we'll use this, this list, and digits equals three. So just in case we want to round it in some different way. And all we're going to do here is going to take, take that code we just wrote and make it general. So we're going to replace the actual literal fit object with the general term fit, which is the argument to the function. Fit indices we placed in here and digits in here. So we now run that, that loads that function into R. So we now have core fit in this four core fit measures, um, which we could then go fits M1 to and it returns um, the fit measures. For good measure, I'll move this now into <clears throat> the lib folder, so it's always available. Um, so that'll automatically be loaded up every time um, I reload the project. So another nice thing now that I put it in the lists, so I could go, you know, pull them out one at a time. But better practice would be to use something like um, air supply. Because I've stored these fits in a list, I can essentially apply a function to each fit object, which is what's going on up here. I'm applying the uh, function core fits measures, fit measures to each um, model fit object. But I could actually pass the, the whole list of fits and then send that to the core fit measures function. Um, and so I write function X, X will be the particular fit. It's, it's sort of like passing in a loop. Um, so now we have something quite nice. We have a table of fits. Um, which shows quite clearly um, uh, the number of 
parameters for each of the three models, chi-squares, um, the fits. So that's very easy to read off now to show, look, RMSEA has gone from 0.124 in a one-factor model to 0.091 for a five-factor uncorrelated to 0.080 for a five-factor correlated. So we've gone from a, well, a dreadful model, or at least a model that makes no pretense of representing the structure in any comprehensive way to one that's uh, approaching something um, reasonable. Um, and we've also highlighted the benefit of storing our fits in lists and then extracting that using a, a function like that. So that's quite nice. Um, and yeah, likewise, we could probably do something similar with standardized solutions to compare loadings, but I don't think there's any need to do that. Okay, so what other models do we want to fit? Um, we fit a one-factor model, we fit a, a five-factor model, model with un, uncorrelated factors, um, we fit a five-factor model with all factors intercorrelated, we haven't fit a data-driven model, and we haven't fitted a, a higher order um, model. So let's perhaps explore the idea of using modification indices to um, justify some data-driven modifications. So if we go back to um, model improvement, we see that there's a function called modification. So let's start with our five-factor correlated model. That seems to be um, pretty good. Um, and if we do that, on that, we can see that we get some modification indices, a lot of them, a lot, lot, lot of them. Um, the problem is that they're of, of different types and some may be a problem. So some will be cross loadings, some will be correlated um, residuals, I think. There may be others as well, I'm not sure. So you want to, in a sense, look at um, perhaps particular categories of loadings and also um, sort them by type. So this is a quite a convenient thing to show the, the largest modification. So let's see what that gives us. Um, so we'll store this as mod end, and the structure of mod end is that it's got a bunch of things, but the mi is the, see the, the modification. So we'll order the data decreasing by modification indices and show the first 10 rows of that. So what we see here is the size of the modification to the chi-square that we would achieve by adding a particular term um, ordered by size. So it seems that adding a correlated residual between N1 and N2 would substantially increase the model, um, as well as adding a few different cross-loadings, um, loading E5 on conscientiousness, N4 on extroversion. So let's have a look at the... Um, meta.personality and just have a quick look at um, so name in so what was it n1 and n2 we'll just we'll just pull out those two um, rows and we see that the two items are get angry easily, get irritated. So that's, they're clearly very similar worded items. Um, if you compare that to other, even neuroticism items, like have frequent mood things, often feel blue, panic easily, there's something more similar about those two items. And therefore it's saying, well, look, the commonality of those two items is greater than just what's shared in general between factors. So we could have a better representation of this test if we allow these two factors to correlate. Um, so um, to do that, we 
we take an existing model we'll call this model 4 and we essentially need to allow these two factors uh, to correlate so we're going to say could add some comments saying correlated uh, residuals and we'd have N1 is correlated with N4. So if we go to Levan, the Levan website and the tutorial, Okay, so you see that for covariances and variances, um, you use a double tilde notation, and for um, factor loadings, you use equals tilde, and for regression or prediction equations, you use a single tilde. So we would use a double tilde here to say that these two items are going to be correlated. We then um, fit that model with uh, well, non-orthogonal um, loadings and we could rerun this general thing because we've added one more model to our fit subject. Oops, and I just uh, got to update that. And we can see here that by adding that um, correlated residual, our chi-square has improved from 2365 to 3.316. So if we just do an Anova fits um, three fits and four, we can do that more explicitly. Um, and we can see that the chi square has changed by 48.6. Um, Oops, so going back, I've clearly added the wrong one. So I should have correlated N1 and N2. So if I do N1 and N2 and um, rerun that, then we see that the model is improved by 148.91, which when we looked at the modification indices, still it's not quite that, so that's intriguing. Um, I was expecting to see that the change in chi square would be the same as the modification. Um, so that's, um, that's something for me to understand better. But certainly the, um, the model has improved substantially. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's an example of um, a correlated um, correlated residual. Let's try an additional one. So you could either run rerun modifications, and that's probably. Uh, advisable or you could simply um, yeah that's probably advisable in general would be to um, run, run, run add one modification at this time but sometimes you can do a couple in a batch um, so now it's saying oh maybe e5 should load on conscientiousness or o4 should load on neuroticism and if we look at um, meta.personality, we look at um, E5, take charge. So perhaps that has elements of conscientious hard working as opposed to making friends and knowing how to captivate people. 
Uh, you may want to think about this a little more, but so we would add, if we wanted to do that modification, and that's always a, an issue, we could add E5 to the conscientious factor. So we'll call this model, model five, and we will uh, fit that object. Um, and then we'll rerun this uh, supply to get all our bits. So we see that now we've got our RMSEA down to 0.076 from a 0.08. So it's starting to approach rules of thumb that would suggest a reasonable model. And certainly if we would persist with, say, a, a large bunch of sort of additional good correlated residuals and so on, we could probably get it to a good model. Um, now, whether that's all appropriate and what that says about the test, that's sort of a, a much broader theoretical question. But that's the, that's the process by which you could um, introduce additional modification. Um, and you can, in particular, you notice the check I've done to check that these things make theoretical sense. Okay, so the final thing um, that we have is to get a global model. So I've never done this before, but let's see if we can. Let's see if it's straightforward. Um, for simplicity, I'll um, I'll build it off um, model two because um, be interested. It, it, there may be sort of, I don't think it really matter to have cross loadings or residuals in a global model, but we'll just keep it simple for now. And so what we're saying is that global um, has these items these latent factors loading on it. Um, so let's see, cross the fingers, okay, model M6. And Not sure whether CFA will work. Um, don't think agreeableness to openness and now um, exogenous variables. So this argument probably won't matter now. Um, uh, so if we look at um, the summary of that model. Um, we can see the chi-square, but probably what we really want is a standardized solution. Ah, I see. Sorry, uh, I've got this wrong. Okay, I'm not sure. So we now have the loading, standardized loadings of each factor on the global factor. Um, so we can see that neuroticism loads negatively, which is as we would expect. Agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, openness are all kind of in the positive direction. And it's interesting to notice that extroversion happens to load most, and then agreeableness, and then the other three are a little bit um, smaller uh, in that regard. So we could then produce a summary, uh, sorry, a, a summary of these fits. Oops. And that's effectively our uh, table of results. Um, and it's interesting to see whether, say, like a, a one-factor solution, which is M6, how that compares to M3. Um, 
in terms of whether you know having unique correlation. Now, it is that M6 does have a larger chi square, but it's also more um, parsimonious. It only took five parameters of correlation between factors rather than ten. So, looking at CFI, um, which is still a little bit lower, RMSCA is pretty much the same. Uh, SRMR RMR is a little bit higher. So it looks like maybe the global factor is not quite as good uh, as, as having correlations for everything, but it goes a fair way to represent the pattern of correlations between factors. Um, if you wanted to export this summary table to say Excel or Word or whatever you're reporting, then we could do write.csv um, sum table and then uh, file equals. Now I usually write to the output folder, so it's a sort of consistent way to store output. So output sum table dot CSV. And then um, if we open that, it should generally open up in Excel. Um, then yeah, you could report you know, your models this way. Um, I actually think maybe it might be nice to transpose the sum table, the sum type summary table. Yeah, I think that might be a bit nicer. So now we have a summary table like that. Um, you could add information like um, one factor model. Uh, two factor, sorry, five factor uncorrelated, five factor correlated, five five factor correlated with you know one mod. Um, this is with two mod modifications and a global factor model. Uh, you can then you can potentially tidy it up in here. Think about what decimal places you want. So I don't know, chi square is probably um, one decimal place is enough. CFI will get it. I quite like custom. 0 0.000, so that, you know, it's always less than one, so it's kind of appropriate. So we'll do, yeah, custom 0 0.000. Could probably get these widths a bit nicer. Um, you could probably fix up the RMSCA and stuff, but I'll just leave it at that. Add some borders, top border, bottom border to make it APA. And yeah, you could probably actually probably should save this as um, I often have a file called output processing. Just where I store any of this sort of manipulation. You know, you just copy your CSV into here and, and do all your kind of edits. Um, Seems like I've gotten too nested into my folder structure to save this file properly, which is kind of um, uh, funny. But um, yeah, you get the idea, you save that. And uh, you copy that into a Word file, you do your report, uh, and there you go. Um, I guess you'd uh, auto fit to the window or whatever it is. We'll make it uh, make it uh, landscape. Okay, so I think that's um, that's all I've got for today. So there you go. That's how you commit confirmatory factor analytic models uh, with that.